Hello, everyone. My name is Jisun Cha. I'm an associate professor of dermatology and dermatopathology at Thomas Jefferson University. And here's Sylvie, uh, Dr. Sylvia Gottesman. Um, hi, I'm Sylvia Gottesman. I'm a dermatopathologist at the Ackerman Academy uh, of Dermatopathology in New York City. Um, yes. And we're hosting a Q&A session with Dr. Adam Rubin. Yes, I would like to introduce Dr. Adam Rubin as our guest today. Dr. Rubin is an associate professor at University of Pennsylvania as a dermatologist, dermatopathologist, and pediatric dermatologist with a special focus on nail disorders. He's a well-known nail expert, and he published a number of articles on this topic. He also wrote an editorial for the article about lichen planus that we will discuss for our upcoming Twitter Journal Club. With this interview with Dr. Gottesman and I, would like to learn from Dr. Rubin about the data from this article with his own perspectives on nail lichen planus and his practical tips. So what we're going to talk about is nail lichen planus. So lichen planus is an inflammatory disorder that affects the skin, mucosal membranes, hair, and nails. Um, and um, it, when it affects the nails, um, that could be seen in up to 10% of the patients, sometimes more. And in some patients, that could be an isolated uh, finding. Um, fingernails are more commonly affected than toenails. And the article that we're going to be discussing in our upcoming journal club uh, on the 28th is the one by Kargoria Gitali and all histopathological evaluation of nail lichen planus, a cross sectional study. And uh, in this uh, article, there were 45 patients patients and 29% 29 uh, of them had isolated nail disease. So um, we're going to start the Q&A session now with Dr. Rubin. Um, and the first, you know, maybe simple question is, do you prefer nail bed or nail matrix biopsies for lichen planus? Well, first, let me say uh, thank you very much to uh, both of the hosts today for this kind invitation to uh, speak with you about my favorite topic, the nail unit. And, uh, you know, this is a really exciting uh, platform uh, about how to discuss um, dermatopathology in, in general. So I, I'm really excited about our, our conversation today. So to, to discuss the answer about which is preferred nail bed or nail matrix uh, biopsies for lichen planus, or I suppose other inflammatory disorders as well, it really, the, the most important thing is to have a specimen that is going to give an answer. And, uh, you know, the, the burden on this falls on the clinician. And what has to happen is in order to get the best yield the specimen needs to take take be taken from the aspect of the nail that is affected. And it can be a little tricky because you have to do some, some correlations even as the clinician. So the first thing is, as, as is stated in, in the uh, article that we're discussing today, in their series and in most other series of nail unit lichen planus, the most common sign is uh, onychorexis which refers to longitudinal ridging of the nail plate. Mm -hmm. When you see on longitudinal ridging of the nail plate, that means that the site of origin is actually the matrix. Mm -hmm. So the matrix creates the nail plate and because there's lichenoid inflammation, as the nail plate is growing out, you get these longitudinal ridges. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is if a patient has longitudinal ridges as their predominant sign, you're gonna to wanna to have a specimen that is taken from the matrix. matrix. So if the patient has predominantly onycholysis, separation of the nail plate from the nail bed, if they have subungual hyperkeratosis mm -hmm. that's present, then you're gonna to wanna to have a nail bed biopsy. So to answer the question, I prefer the specimen that's gonna have the highest yield, the best answer for the patient, and that is a specimen that is best chosen from the correct anatomic area of the nail unit. Uh, the, you know, in terms of processing and grossing, when you have nail matrix uh, specimens, generally the nail plate is, is soft in that area. They're not much more difficult to process than regular skin specimens. Same thing is true with a nail bed 
specimen generally, especially if there's onycholysis, the tissue is very soft, it's straightforward to process. Um, so I think that uh, either one is okay. And uh, the, as, a, as a practical tip, what I do recommend to people when they're taking these specimens is to use a certain color ink that can be put on the top of the specimen so your technicians know which way is up. So for specimens which are uh, taken from other parts of the skin, they're easy to orient. If you have a specimen from the back, the chest, whatever, you can see easily see the shape of the specimen. But sometimes these get distorted because of the procedure of removing the specimen from the nail unit. So if you ink the top with, mm -hmm. we can use Mohs ink, other kinds of ink in your, your clinic, but with a color that is will easily stick on, green, black, whatever, that you the, the indicate that on your requisition form that the top of the specimen is inked in black, whatever, mm -hmm. then the technicians, once they get the specimen, they'll know they can bisect it, they can put the whole specimen in and orient it in the correct way. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what has happened in the past, you can easily get uh, an alopecia type of processing, which horizontal, which you don't want if the technicians are not able to orient the specimen correctly. And that can happen with either matrix or nail bed biopsies. Can, can you comment on patients that have more severe nail disease from like in planus, like um, anarnicia and the pterygium? Um, how is the procedure different? And then how are the histologic uh, findings different from more milder? Or are there any, is there any scarring in severe disease that we don't see in mild or moderate disease? So if the patient has pterygium or scarring, uh, really they're getting to you too late because uh, that is not reversible. And really we want to emphasize to everyone that you want to have your biopsy done. You want to have the patient come in before that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, to answer the question, if you were to do a biopsy from a pterygium area, from an area that's long established and looks scarred, you're going to see scar mm -hmm. and that biopsy will not really be helpful in establishing a diagnosis of, of lichen planus mm -hmm. uh, because you can have a scar from, from all, kinds of, all kinds of problems. So really you want to address this when there are other features present, hyperkeratosis, mm -hmm. onycholysis, onychorexis. Really, if, uh, if the patient is scarred, even uh, you may attempt different uh, medications, but it's, it's unlikely to, to help. Mm -hmm. But to answer the question about uh, how do we deal with severe lichen planus, people can easily have severe pain, if it's very uh, active uh, at the moment, if the nails are changing very rapidly, mm -hmm. then you do want to address that uh, in an organized and efficient manner. And part of the answer to that will depend, it will relate to this other article we were talking about from the JAD about the consensus uh, recommendations for different medications for nail unit like planus. In the article, the author mentioned about the frayed nail plate, uh, but I couldn't really find the reference article readily in uh, PubMed. Can you give us some uh, explanation about this frayed nail plate? Sure. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, to share my screen so we're all on the same uh, page about what the authors of the article that we are talking about is are referencing because it's a novel finding. It's a novel description. So I'm going to share my screen now. And what you can see here, uh, the, the panel A is the findings that the authors have put forth as the frayed nail plate. And what they're referring to is this area in the center and I have it here, what it was described as, it's described as a histopathological feature seen as separation of individual orthokeratotic onychocytes of the nail plate, like a thin or worn out fabric where the individual fibers are separating from each other. <laughs> and that is the, the definition that the authors have put forward and it's shown in this area over here, you can imagine that these areas of nail plate that are thin strips, here's normal 
uh, nail plate at the, the top of the picture and also at the, the bottom of the picture. So this is this new concept that they've put forward about the frayed nail plate. So something to look forward to uh, look in your in your specimens. Mm -hmm. I will get back. I'll talk about the other portion about what had been described in the past. But one thing I want to mention is that this study focused on nail lichen planus. Mm -hmm. And what is not clear at this point is, is this feature, the frayed nail plate, limited to lichen planus? Or might it be seen with other dermatoses that affect the nail? We haven't been looking for this feature in the past. So maybe it's a common feature. Maybe it's related to nail lichen planus only. We really don't know because it's a novel, a novel concept. So something that will have to be examined in the future is what is the diagnostic uh, reliance we can put on this, this finding? New idea will be developed more in the future, but it's certainly uh, very interesting. And that was my next question. <laughs> sure, please, please. Uh, what what's what other que question about about that? Any any other like uh, features of a nail plate uh, to clue us in uh, the nail like planus or any other nail condition? Because we often get just a nail plate without any attached nail bed or nail matrix and the PAS is negative. So I, I mean, is there any way that we can give a little more specific diagnosis with such specimens? Now remember, we, we're limiting this discussion to a half hour. Let's <laughs> just save it for maybe a follow-up Q&A. Maybe right. maybe a follow-up discussion. There is, there is an article that I published in 2015 with uh, Antonella Tosti, and I, I can't remember the, the name of it. It was like, oh yeah, diagnostic applications from nail clippings. And uh, it will put you to sleep uh, but it's, it goes through a lot of different things. And I have to say, since 2015, there's been more advances about uh, the, his, the diagnostic features of, of nail clippings. So the first thing I'll say, let me go, I'll backtrack a bit. These specimens, as far as I can tell from the article, the original article, were either from the nail bed or from the nail matrix. So we don't know right now what if the frayed nail plate will be found in nail clippings or not, or it's something to, to look for. Um, so, that's, so that's one thing. The other thing which I'll, I'll say is that to answer your other components, actually the, the disorder that you can get an enormous amount of information from, from nail clippings is really nail psoriasis. In the, in the Durham Path literature, there has been, I don't wanna say an explosion, but there's been a lot of new information in the past few years that shows that you can get reliable information, diagnostic information about nail unit psoriasis because in nail psoriasis, there'll be features of um, you know, neutrophils within, in, and we're talking about nail plate now, yeah. neutrophils within areas of, of hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis, you can have serum, uh, serum lakes, uh, other features that, that can be seen. Mm -hmm. And so in, in particular for children or adults that don't wanna have a full nail biopsy, you can get a lot of information from a nail clipping. So dermatopathologists should be aware of this because I think the times have changed that if you submit a specimen for, as a clinician for is this psoriasis or not, these days from a nail clipping, dermatopathologists should be able to comment on that possibility, not just this is a nail plate, no fungus. Okay. Um, so that's a, that's a real uh, advance. The other, and so the other thing is that, um, and then of course, you know, uh, you can start using nail clippings for melanonychia, where can you predict um, you know, a pigmented band's gonna be. There's a lot of, a lot of different things that can, that can happen. For nail lichen planus, uh, also tracheonychia, really, I think at this stage of the game, it's excluding concomitant onychomycosis or just onychomycosis uh, in general. 
And potentially you might see some other features as we're mentioning of neal psoriasis or, or something like that. But what I wanna do is I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna share the other screen, which is that original article that showed some similar but, but different features. So you can see here, uh, this is the original uh, article. Let me go to the top so everybody can, can see which article I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, it's, I believe, in, in Portuguese, but this uh, is also has English uh, translation. So the base of the histopathological study of, of nail lesions. And they, they talk about the original description uh, here was so-called, quote, loss of cohesion of onychocytes. And I'll show you, there's two images from this original article from 2003 that shows that uh, area. Here it is if I go forward here. Mm -hmm. So here's an example of uh, tracheonychia in figure one, which I'm pointing to here. And you can see that there is this separation. Uh, there's some space between different areas of the nail plate. But I think you'd agree that this looks different than that frayed nail plate, uh, which is shown in lichen planus, but at least it, it does have an idea that there's some separation of the different areas of the nail plate. And then if I go forward, uh, here's another example. This is uh, uncle psoriasis, the nail plate with the loss of cohesion of onychocytes. Uh, and you can see there are some areas of separation of the nail plate uh, within it that uh, is a feature that the art, the original, um, authors had, had identified. So I'm going to stop yeah. sharing over here and, uh, and come back to our, our conversation. So it will be very interesting to see if that uh, is present, the frayed nail plate and other inflammatory disorders affecting the nail. But to mm -hmm. get back to lichen plana, nail right. lichen planus, you know, we have the usual things. Um, we have the hypergranulosis, the sawtooth acanthosis, and the lichenoid band of inflammatory infiltrate, and, you know, boom, that, you know, is lichen planus. Uh, what I wanted to ask ne next is that um, presence of rare eosinophils, it's a much debated um, discussion among dermatopathologists about cutaneous lichen planus, especially in a patient that doesn't have any history of medication use and where you can raise the, you know, is this a lichenoid drug eruption? So, is this something that you know you've seen in nail lichen planus biopsies? Have you seen you know one or two eosinophils? Does it even matter? So, uh, what I will I'll tell you first my my personal experience, and then I'll go back to some other comments uh, about the the parent article uh, itself. The first thing I'll say, and again, there there may be a uh, a bias from the samples that I see because they're from definitely people from our community, but also we have a large surgical group here and, uh, and I also do my own nail biopsies. So I, when I get the specimens from our group and from here, often they are diagnostic, mm -hmm. I would say. And often what I will see is some lichenoid inflammatory infiltrate and some epidermal changes that are lichenoid with sawtooth acanthosis, you know, et cetera. So I think from my experience, if you pick, if you send a good sample that's from the right area, there's a high chance of getting a specific diagnosis. In terms of eosinophils, sure, I, I've seen eosinophils in nail, uh, nail specimens, but I have to say overall, when I'm looking at nail lichen planus specimens, in general, the infiltrate is a lot less than other areas of the skin. Lichen planus from other parts of the skin surface, whether it's the, the extremities, the trunk, there's usually a robust uh, inflammatory infiltrate. But really in the nail, when I'm seeing any kind of uh, even an inflammatory infiltrate that's even more than, than mild, I mean, that is, a indication that something is going on in the nail because generally the nail is a sterile area. There really isn't any inflammatory cells at all. So that's another, another clue. What I wanted to emphasize from the parent article is that the most common finding which was identified was that half of specimens showed hypergranulosis. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. That was the, the main thing. So if you see hypergranulosis in the nail matrix or the nail bed, then this is a clue that this could be lichen planus. The second thing is that 44% of the cases showed sawtooth acanthosis. So again, uh, something really to look out for, but it was only 24% of the cases had a lichenoid tissue reaction. So there's a, a few takeaways. One thing is that my own personal experience is a little bit different from this. The other, but and in that what it seems, if you're looking at this data, that means that half of the cases then did not have the main feature of hypergranulosis. And then half of the cases did not have sawtooth acanthosis. And then most of the cases did not have a lichenoid tissue reaction. Mm -hmm. Is that related to that punch biopsies were used? Is this related to what areas were, were sampled? You know, it's, it's unclear. Um, and also there really isn't an, isn't an analysis about, well, did the cases that had hypergranulosis, did they also have lichenoid inflammation? Like it, that analysis is not present in the paper, but there are some good takeaways, which are that for sure, using a punch biopsy is a reasonable way to, uh, to sample these types of patients for lichen planus. And if you're looking at the data that's presented, you're doing pretty well if one out of two specimens really has some diagnostic features because these were all patients that clinically were highly suspected to have lichen planus, whether it's from lichen planus that was on other parts of the body, the oral mucosa, the, you know, the features in the nail. So that's something to think about. And also this article is the largest analysis of nail lichen planus that, of specimens and analysis of them that has been done before. Uh, the other articles which had established some diagnostic features were smaller. I mean, it was under 10 patients, each one, the one from Nardo's Ice and uh, the other one from uh, Hanno et al. And other articles which have had patients in the 20s, not as many as this, this article, it didn't really analyze, they didn't analyze uh, the histopathologic features as this article does in detail. So this article really is uh, a platform for going forward and may serve some future baseline for the re-evaluation of how nail unit lichen planus is, is diagnosed by dermatopathologists. Great. Um, so uh, as a pediatric uh, dermatologist, um, Ruben, uh, how often do you see a nail lichen planus in pediatric population? So I'll, I'll, I'll clarify, I do have a pediatric uh, uh, nail clinic and uh, I am a pediatric dermatopathologist. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I work at CHOP doing the pediatric uh, dermatopathology, but I'm not formally a, a pediatric dermatologist, but I do see plenty of, of uh, uh, pediatric nail patients. What I'll say is in my experience, the most common uh, nail inflammatory problem that, that I see that people refer to in children would actually be tracheonychia. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course, tracheonychia can be um, uh, a presentation of nail unit lichen planus, maybe it is. Other term for that would be 20 nail dystrophy. Yeah. Um, so I would say that uh, overall tracheonychia would be more common, but in children, uh, also the other thing that you can see is uh, uh, nail uh, lichen, lichen striatus. So uh, affecting the nail unit also in children, but I would say, and also the other, the other thing in my own particular clinic is patients who generally have nail predominant findings because often if they have lichen planus other places, they're getting treated you know, in other ways and so forth. So there's a focus for the nails in my own clinic. But in general, I would say that overall, uh, nail lichen planus in children, considering the number of visits, all kinds of things that, that uh, people are coming for is, is, uh, is uncommon. And if there is a, it is more common than, than traditional nail lichen planus, at least in my experience, that patients are having the trachea form of it, 
which again, we don't tend, to, which is a whole other discussion, but we don't tend to do biopsies on trachea unless it's severe or recalcitrant to, to therapy. Mm -hmm. I'll tie on to Dr. Cha's question about um, uh, nail disease in the pediatric population. Can you compare and contract, contrast histologic differences or similarities between nail lichen planus and nail lichen striatus, or perhaps comment on other you know, modes, diagnostic modes for this rather than a biopsy, perhaps maybe dermoscopy? Right, so you know, in, in children, mm -hmm. we really try not to do uh, procedures. Uh, that's why one of the things that's a real advance is the nail clippings for nail psoriasis in children uh, can be very helpful. So um, in general, we are really with the pediatric population trying to treat before doing any kind of uh, uncomfortable um, uh, procedures. And the younger you get, the more uh, involved it gets because sometimes the children need to be sedated. You don't want to do that. So we really are, uh, you know, sort of reluctant to do surgical procedures unless it's absolutely necessary for children. Adults, totally different, you know, uh, discussion. Uh, most of the time adults can, can tolerate procedures. So um, one thing I'll do, I'll, I'll share, uh, share my screen again, just to show you this article that we have um, here we go. Uh, if people are, are interested in, it's over here. Uh, nail lichen striatus, is, is dermoscopy useful for the diagnosis? I was one of the authors on this, this paper where we showed uh, there was a series of, of five patients. This is from pediatric dermatology. And really that dermoscopy can be helpful. You can see uh, in this example, there are these uh, areas of um, on the uh, on the nail, you can see also that there's some papules that go mm -hmm. along with nail lichen striatus, which uh, in my experience, of course, is, is more common in children than in adults, this particular pattern. Um, and you can see some hyperkeratosis that's here and some erythema that's also, mm -hmm. also found. Uh, in terms of the, the discussion, so when we were putting this uh, article together, I remember that was a question that came up and I will tell you that uh, most people are not biopsying nail lichen striatus in children, probably for the same reasons that we discussed about regular lichen planus in the nail. Um, we do, we're trying to avoid procedures. And in after doing searches, because we actually tried to get one, you know, for this for this paper, uh, all I can say is that not only are they are they rare lichen striatus nail biopsies because of they happen in the pediatric, pediatric population. People tried to treat beforehand. Yeah. Um, but the one thing I found was that they had a lichenoid inflammatory infiltrate. I can just say that. Um, and you know, lichen striatus on other parts of the body, you're looking for the periecrine involvement, yeah. uh, but in the nail, you don't have those structures necessarily to even look for that. And so it's, it's a, unusual clinical diagnosis. It's unusual to try to get, uh, well, to you know, proceed with the biopsy. And then uh, of those, it's, it's you know, of, of what I've read about uh, is, and seen is that it's just gonna have a similar lichenoid dermatitis. And if one needs really a biopsy, they can do of a skin lesion along that band. Totally agree. Of involvement. That I have seen more commonly. Yeah. That that uh, you will have a child that potentially has uh, lichen striatus, and then they'll have a biopsy of another part of the the finger yeah. um, or other part of the body, right? Depending on what's happening, and that will also have typical uh, lichenoid dermatitis changes. Uh, I have to say, uh, from the specimens I've seen from other parts of the of the fingers um, or toes, they they haven't necessarily had necessarily obviously uh, obvious uh, ecrine involvement, but a, a lot of it is the clinical correlation. That if you have a, a lichenoid dermatitis, that's a big big victory. Okay, good. So. So if we talk next about uh, injection techniques, you know, nail, nail matrix or nail bed, 
uh, whether you know it's nail lichen planus or nail lichen striatus um, can you you know talk us through that there's some um, in the consensus paper from the JAD, um, there's some uh, the Burker Lawrence uh, technique, the Reichert Lawrence, uh, the Reichert technique, and the Grover Bansell technique. And which one's your favorite, and and why? Or is there sure. a technique? <laughs> sure. So right, it's like so many things. I got to pub publish my own my own technique. Uh, I'll show you. Let me let me switch to here. Uh, share my share my screen. So here, um, this is the this is the uh, diagram, which is uh, being discussed. Uh, these different you can see in uh, panel A the David Deberker uh, method and uh, B uh, Dr. Richer and uh, C uh, Dr. Grover. You can see these different um, mechanisms uh, that are done. Uh, well, first, what I'll say is my own my own technique. Is probably closest to uh, the figure uh, A, where uh, I will do injections at the uh, proximal nail fold. I always dilute with 1% uh, lidocaine without uh, epinephrine to make it more comfortable for the patient. I use a cold spray. It's uh, and no conflict of interest. The name of it is called Pain Ease, but uh, that's that's what I use. Mm -hmm. um, you know the the thing about it is again. When you're using these different nail injections, you're trying to target the area that is affected. So, for example, if someone has onychorexis, then when you're injecting into the proximal nail fold, you're going to be sending the medication close to the matrix, or it can diffuse into the matrix, so it will treat that area. And again, if you're looking in the, if you're injecting around the the nail bed. Uh, you are going to be using, um, if you're trying to uh, address things like uh, erythema, hyperkeratosis, onycholysis, things that happen in, in the nail bed itself. Um, it's relatively com uh, comfortable for patients to have uh, injections in the proximal nail fold. The nail bed area, and you'll get different conversations from different nail experts about what needs to be done it's absolutely more sensitive in that area. And depending on where you're located, what someone's style is, sometimes people will use digital blocks to numb either the, the finger or the hand, whatever, so it's more comfortable, other kinds of sedation. Um, but uh, one trick that I have found, which can be helpful uh, for both uh, adults and uh, children is the use of uh, EMLA, so, uh, you know, anesthetic cream can be used and also uh, vibratory uh, distraction uh, devices. Again, no conflict of interest, but the one I uh, use is the, the Buzzy. So it's, it can be, it's a distraction device and it blocks out some of the, some of the uh, discomfort. And, uh, you know, I, I think that you can see because the, the areas which are most uncomfortable would be around the nail bed and hyponychium. You can imagine which of these different techniques uh, would be you know, most uncomfortable. Um, I've never tried this, this technique and see, it looks a little intense where you're, uh, in, you put the needle basically under the, you know, through the uh, nail fold and, and, to, and it extends to the nail bed. I've never done that. Um, but you know, these other areas uh, you know, are, are reasonable and I have done those techniques and they, and they, and they work well. Um, just so people can see what, oh, you can see the, the reference over here and I can, I'll move this up. Yeah, let's keep this shared screen because it's really great. And our next question is about yeah. paper two. Um, yeah. Figure two uh, from this uh, review in the JAD right. uh, has a really nice broken down algorithm by how you would treat nail lichen planus, you know, whether it's mild, moderate or severe. And I know that's a discussion in and of itself. And, and you know, we talked about intralesional uh, triamcinolone, but what I was really interested in is the intramuscular triamcinolone dosing. So I know you use anywhere between 0.5 to 1 mg per kg and say the patient does not have any history of diabetes or osteoporosis or glaucoma, but they're a little bit overweight or maybe even obese. And what, you know, 
max dose of intramuscular uh, triamcinolone would you do? Would it be, you know, 60 milligrams, 80 milligrams, you know, or, or more? I, I know in the rheumatology literature, it could be around 80, but where do you, you know, draw the line? I'm just curious. So it's, it's an interesting thing. And, and some of this uh, is going to, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the, the chart, which is, which is up on the, the shared screen right now. And what I will say, the first thing is I'm, I'm sure people saw from the, the, the author list is that this was really a, a worldwide uh, effort and for these recommendations. So uh, these are the, the recommendations that you know, the uh, nail experts from around the world can, can agree on. And uh, I believe that the intramuscular trimcinolone is more popular uh, in Europe, although you'll hear different uh, discussions here. Um, actually, if I, if I can ask you both a quick a quick question, and we can get back to this, mm -hmm. from people that you work with in your own experience, how common do you find people using intramuscular triamcinolone for any kind of of dermatosis? Do you find that it's common or uncommon or are people comfortable with it? Does it depend? What, what's your experience been from people you work with? I don't think it's very common among the young dermatologists. I think it's more common in the senior uh, dermatologist population. Uh, they use it for like lichen planus. I think that's probably the most common use. Um, and then like these days, actually the rituximab replaced the uh, IM Canalog, but mm -hmm. a lot of people used to use IM Canalog for bullous pemphigoid too. And sometimes more like a mild pemphigus vulgaris and for very severe poison ivy, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, I have seen people using it. And when we don't really have any coverage by the patient insurance for using these expensive medications, then we also use it, or if there is any contraindication to use other immune modifier, uh, instead of using the oral uh, prednisone sometimes, when we expect it's gonna be the chronic use, uh, the IM Canelo can be a good option too. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the younger uh, dermatologists, I think they are more afraid of using IM Canelo. I think it became more like a trend. And I don't know if there is actually any good basis for that. I, I'm in the middle. So I, I use it um, not frequently, but from time to time, for, especially for like implantless patients. My experience has been the same. Um, dermatologists that have been in practice more than you know, 20 years, that they, they use that sometimes. Um, and um, I, I have used it only once for very severe nummular uh, dermatitis and 60 milligrams has worked really well at, you know, six weeks inter intervals, three to four times once, you know, everything has, you know, subsided and we go down to milder topicals. And this was in a patient that didn't have any, you know, diabetes or osteoporosis or, or, or glaucoma. Um, so I, I would say the comfort, I guess, in the younger dermatologist would be in patients that don't have any, um, you know, medical disorders that would, you know, preclude it from using. So I'll say that my experience mirrors what you're both, uh, you're both saying. And uh, so I think there may be some different uh, practice patterns around the world. And, but what I will tell you from my own, so first of all, this is, this, this uh, chart is really great to use and, and, and to go forward. I would tell you that um, most of the time, the patients I'm seeing are very happy with uh, intralesional injections. And most of the time they are improving. So it's, it's not something that I commonly have to go forward to for using um, intramuscular uh, triamcinolone. So, in terms of, Sylvia, so you're asking about like, do I have a do I have a strict you know dose or a, a limit and, and things like that? Not really, because when it's being used, it's it's usually in in someone hits that has uh, I don't know maybe moderate disease or something, and and you know you're 
you're going forward. So, uh, you know, the, the ranges that you were mentioning, you know, 60, 80, you know, again, it's, it's one time, but the patients, if you're going to be using it over time, of course, they have to have, you know, uh, in, injections monthly and, and it has to be a, a taper and they have to be on uh, uh, calcium and vitamin D, you know, prophylaxis and things mm -hmm. like this. So in, I, I, I don't, it's something that has not been, been a problem for me that I'm like, oh, well, because probably because of the next thing that I'm going to say mm -hmm. is that um, you know, we have had really good success. So, and this has to do with also your, your uh, original question about severe lichen planus. Mm -hmm. So when it's severe, what we have been using here at Penn is the mycophenolate mofetil and Cellcept. And it works very, very well. Really what works. Was, very, uh, what was your dose for salsa? The, the dose, and it's actually in this article, mm -hmm. it's uh, 1,000 milligrams uh, twice a day. I see. And, you know, of course, you can adjust it depending on what your, uh, the, how the patient's doing, other issues, whatever. But that's the, the dose that in general that we're, that we're using. And it's, as I say, if people want to look it up, it's in this, this article um, and it works, uh, you know, very well. Um, of course, there's, you know, these issues of, of COVID now, and we don't want to have people on immunosuppressants. Um, but I will tell you that for people with pain, severe disease, it's really worked well. And, you know, your initial question about the the triamcinol and injection, it's not something that, that I use or have heard people use for severe disease. And just in my own experience, if someone has severe disease, they're getting on CELSEP, they're gonna do well. Um, I also use uh, topicals, usually uh, topical steroids, also uh, tazarotene, retinoid uh, has been, there's some evidence that, it, that it's helpful, so I use that. So, uh, and, and really we've had a uh, great experience with uh, mycophenolate uh, mofetil. So, uh, and, and like I said, in generally the people are either mild, mild, moderate or severe. Uh, the, and also I've, I have found some reluctance from patients actually about having a, uh, a steroid injection. Intramuscular steroid injection. Yeah, I, I have a dose patient. I have yeah. a dose patient, yes. And yes. I'm not sure if it's because they can't get the medicine out, that once it's in, you can't get it out, or that they don't want to have a shot, or that they yeah, don't you know. Overall, like a lot of patients don't want the, the systemic steroid. So mm -hmm. I think that's part of the reason. Right. Yes. So, and, and also, I, I mean, of course, you know, it will work, but you do have to have a taper um, and uh, it can come, come back. And uh, so, so that I guess that's that's my answer in terms of I think people um, they they do well with intralesional injections. Uh, they do well with topicals. Uh, they do well, uh, and they do well when it's when it's severe with um, uh, with mycophenolate. I, I would like to use uh, acetretin more. I think especially with, with COVID now in terms of not having uh, this immune suppression, but again, you're sort of limited in, in terms of uh, patient population about who can get it and uh, you know, limits that uh, a little bit. So- You just are... mentioned about topical, uh, is that tazaridine that you're using? Yes. Or topical? yes. I see. Yeah, I don't, um, I, I don't. I didn't pull the the literature on this, and it's not it's not that strong. But there are uh, examples in the literature for other kinds of lichen planus about using topical retinoids. And also, I remember I started using it uh, way back because there was a at least one case report that showed that it's helpful, and I I found it to be helpful uh, ever since. Uh, so that that's usually my regimen is. Um, uh, if the patient can tolerate it uh, once a day, uh, Monday through Friday with um, tazarotene, and if they like, uh, you know, a cream or a gel, depending, that's okay with me. And then on the weekends, topical steroids. And if they're getting too irritated from the tazarotene, they can skip to every other 
day, but I found patients are, are compliant and uh, very happy about it. And do you use a topical steroid on top of that? Like no, no. So, I mean, I wouldn't have a problem with that, but my own regimen is I have them use it on the weekend only, twice a day on uh, Saturday and Sunday. I mean, there's nothing magic about Saturday and Sunday. It's just that they're not getting steroids nonstop, you know, all the time, and they're not getting the uh, irritation uh, nonstop from uh, the uh, Tazerac, Tazeratine. I will tell you, I have found that people get more irritation on the toes as opposed to the fingernails, but I don't know why, and that's just my experience with it. I see. Um, and the reason why you're using us, uh, clavetazole is to reduce the irritation from the tazaritin and also reduce the inflammation from the lichen plants. So it's interesting. So I, I, I use myself actually triamcinolone. Um, I, you know, for chronic use around the uh, fingers, I try to avoid uh, super, you know, the, the real high potent stuff because you can get um, bone absorption around the, um, uh, around the finger uh, and other you know, side effects. So even though it's just the weekend, because it's, it's really long-term, I mean, these patients tend not, it's not, it's a chronic disease. It's not something that generally people are cured of. Mm -hmm. um, at least it's, it's, uh, controlled. Um, so I tend to use triamcinolone, you know, for a little bit, I wouldn't have a problem with, uh, clobetazole. Uh, it's, you know, I've never thought of it about controlling, uh, the irritation from the, the, uh, tazaritine. It's more just another mechanism to control the, um, uh, inflammation from lichen planus. You know, the penetration of the Topical steroid through the proximal nail fold is not great. That's why the injections work really well. But topicals are really good for people who have nail bed disease, in particular onycholysis, because you can clip away the nail plate and they can put the medicine directly on the area that is uh, affected. So that's important that the patients, if they have onycholysis, that they put, that they really clip back the. Um, uh, the nail plate before putting the medicine on. And also for the, um, for the um, uh, tazeratine that they can put it on other areas of the, of the nail and it will, you know, penetrate somewhat, uh, but it doesn't have the same side effects as uh, the uh, strong topical steroids. Mm -hmm. I, I was glad to see that this review paper mentioned that hydroxychloroquine and methotrexate have been ineffective for nail lichen planus disease. And that has been my experience too in patients on methotrexate that had cutaneous disease and nail disease when the cutaneous disease improves and the nail disease hasn't, hasn't really improved. So yeah, I did. One more question? Well, yeah, I, so, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, you know, well, I find this, this article to be a, a wonderful uh, benefit because now you can go and this is a, a real pathway that's been approved and recommended by, by nail experts. And uh, you know, like you're saying, I mean, those, those medications are, are not on this list. So uh, good, you know, good to move forward and, and medicine is always, always changing. And uh, you know, we have to keep up with all this new, new information. How about this new innovative treatment at uh, the immune modifiers like JAG inhibitors or other interleukin inhibitors? Do you have any input uh, for us? Any experience? Uh, not myself. I mean, you know, it's uh, what I have found, and if it's fortunate in the different regimens I've been uh, discussing, I haven't had someone who hasn't. Uh, continue to progress. So um, if I get into that situation, for sure, I will, you know, consider these other things. And um, of course, insurance coverage is always, always a problem if it's a non FDA uh, approved uh, indication. At least what I like is that uh, if for some reason, and I haven't had any problems yet um, with uh, the medications that we're, that we're talking about here, um, you can always send in you know, the article to the insurance company and say, here, this, you know, this should be approved. Um, but uh, I'd be open to other, other types of, of treatment. Uh, 
you know, if if needed, probably we need a little bit more, uh, a little bit more data, uh, especially for a uh, insurance company to approve the use. These are expensive medications, but uh, I don't have any personal experience, but would be open to learning about it. Fortunately, like I said, you know, um, our patients have been uh, had success. The people who are severe with uh, mycophenolate and mofetil, the people who are uh, moderate, mostly with uh, injections, local injections and um, topicals. Super. Yeah. yeah, that's great. We don't need uh, this kind of expensive medication because those new medications are great, but they are <laughs> really expensive. So yeah, we have to yeah consider yet that that will be amazing. I'll, I'll briefly say the other thing I've, I've used, which is uh, can be helpful, is uh, topical tacrolimus. The, the protopic is another, uh, you know, immunomodulator that can be uh, helpful and is, is non-irritating. And if sometimes I've rotated with that, if there's been some insurance, something that comes up, but uh, that's another option. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Rubin, thank you so much. This has been a very fruitful discussion and we are very fortunate to learn from you about yeah. nail lichen planets and especially Absolutely. about treatment of nail lichen planets. Um, and this is such an innovative way to bring the content to our viewers. And thank you for the screen sharing. I think they're gonna much appreciate that so they can see what we're talking about. So um, thank you so, so much for joining us, Dr. Chow. This was amazing. I really, really, really thank you. that this took place. <laughs> well, this was really, really great. I had, I had a lot of fun and uh, happy to come back for any other discussions about the nail unit. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.